Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I know that God wants us to share all things, but for those of you that shared your head cold with me, <laughs> I'm praying God's blessings on you. <laughs> In whatever form he chooses to take. I hope it's not my fault. No, after last week with all the sniffling and coughing, I'm sure that it was a group effort. <laughs> um, we are going to continue with our testify series today. Um, and I'm, I'm just going to kind of prep you because I asked about three weeks ago. I asked Sina if she would share her testimony with us, and she said, let me, let me think about it, pray about it. I will do it, just, just let me think about it. She should have said yes right then, right? <laughs> and she should have done it that Sunday, because I'll tell you what, the enemy does not want her sharing what God has laid on her heart, because uh, she has had a horrific, gosh, it's been a couple of weeks now. So... I am going to turn this over to Sina and uh, let her just share what God has laid on her heart. Okay? I got my bag just in case I need it. Um, <laughs> but Glenn, Glenn's right. Um, he looked at me, I was at prayer meeting on one, one Wednesday, and he looked at me and he says, When are you going to do your testimony? Just like that. I don't remember that. I do. <laughs> I remember that. What I should have heard was, when are you going to put on the armor of God? Amen. Because that's exactly what happened when he asked me. It's been, um, not only has my life had some really big ups and downs, but the last three weeks have been really hard. Um, My boys aren't here for a reason. And I'm hoping that after I get all this out, this might be my way of healing, having God help me heal through this because I still have problems with it. Um, I think after I get this over with, my rainbow will come out somehow. Um, I brought props because I'm a very visual person. So this is my heart. And when everybody's born, it's whole. You don't know the difference between right and wrong. You don't know anything other than your own life, you know, your own family, your own interpretation of what a whole heart is. So I grew up in a household with two loving parents and three brothers and typical go to church on Sunday and consistency and structure and the whole nine yards. But when I turned into becoming a teenager, Rebellion was kind of in the air. Um, I think every teenager goes through that. Anyway, um, I decided that, yeah, I knew. I knew God. At least I thought I did. I believe, I believe there was one, let's put it that way, but I didn't believe in him. I didn't believe that, you know, he was, I thought, I thought he was in everyone else's God, not mine. And I figured, you know what, I can do this on my own. I can figure this out. This is my life. I can do what I want. And in high school, 19 high school, senior high school, I uh, got pregnant with a set of twins. And uh, I was in an abusive relationship at the time. And you start to believe the lies. You start to believe the, you start to believe that. You start to, you, Satan starts to use you as a toy and you start to believe everything he says. You're worthless, you're useless, you're not anything. You deserve this. This is just the way life is. You don't deserve love, and you 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 rebelled, and this is this is what you deserve. And this are the things, and you start to believe it every every day. You get told these things every day. And so with that, you know, being in that, believing all of that, I just my heart starts to break, you know, just a little bit. It just it's just a little bit. And so then I'm like, okay, well that that wasn't so bad. I'm, I guess I'll figure it out. So I moved to Montana after being in a really abusive relationship from as big as round as I was wide and mm -hmm. tall. And so I'm going to school. I decided to go to college and I'm studying school. And I thought, well, at least I'll get my mind off of it. You know, it's really hard to waddle through the halls in college. But anyway, um, better than trying to sit in a desk in high school. Mm -hmm. 
And so I uh, decided, you know, like, oh, I'm going to do what I can, and I'm, and I'm pretty big. And so my pregnancy is okay, but then I end up going into labor um, seven weeks before I should have. And I had a boy and a girl in, in November, and I had to leave them in the hospital after they were born because they didn't know how to suck, they didn't know how to... They didn't know how to do anything, but they were healthy. They were, you know, good size four pounds for twins. And, um, but leaving them in the hospital, I mean, I felt like a, a mother with no kids. You know, I couldn't bring them home. I didn't, you know, it really hurt. And I still, you know, after all of that, I um, was able to have a little bit of time to kind of heal and, and stuff too, but it was really hard not being able to bring my babies home. So I decided to go back to school and just try to finish up what I could. And eventually they got to come home. Um, three weeks later, they, get, they came home and um, they were, you know, little. And I was new and I felt like more like a babysitter than a mom because it didn't hit me yet. And um, so one day, three months into it, my son got really sick. And he, I brought him to the doctor, to the emergency room, because he was coughing so bad he turned blue. And when he turned blue, it just scared me, and I didn't know what to do. And it, it really hurt to see him just powerless against this, against helping him. So I brought him to the ER, and the doctor looked at him, well, yeah, just give him some over-the-counter medication. It'll be okay. And while I was there, I decided to go up back to the maternity ward and see some of the nurses that helped me and just go up there and talk to them. And... The nurse looked at my son sitting in his car seat and she goes, he looks blue. What is going on? I was like, I just took him to the ER that told me to give him this medication. And she put him on the blood oxygen machine and checked it and it was at a 70% and she got scared. She's like, there's something wrong and he, he needs more than just over the counter medication. And so she took some, takes him back down to the ER and I waited for some results. I did some blood work. They checked him for all kinds of stuff. I didn't know what was wrong with him and uh, finally came back and said, we need to air flight them to Great Falls. We don't have the right facilities here. And I'm like, well, what's wrong? And they said, well, the results came back that he has pertussis. And he was vaccinated. But he shouldn't have gotten the vaccinated when he did because he was too little for it. So he wasn't a weight. And so they air flighted him to Great Falls. And I was really scared. You know, I, don't, I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know if they could help him. And I'm just tore up not knowing what to do. Then I'm at Great Falls and I'm doing what I need to do up there and filling out paperwork and talking to the doctors and he was up there for 10 days, 12 days actually. Finally he comes up to me and he's on all these tubes and they had to you know, sedate him so he was basically paralyzed you know, so he didn't cough. Came back with the results of him having pneumonia. And um, The pneumonia didn't get any better, and he was out. He was without blood oxygen for so long; he was basically brain damaged. So, the doctor nonchalantly came up to me and he says, "Would you like to hold your son? You haven't held him for 12 days." And I said, "I would love to hold him, but what does that mean?" And he said, "Do you have to take everything off of him? His respirator, all the everything?" He goes, "When I take him off of this stuff, he's going to die." But. What kind of a life is he going to have if you let him live? That day, I prayed to God, and I was just begging, Tim, please take me. Just, just please take me. I don't, I don't want to deal with this. And um, I knew it was time to, to let him go. So they took everything off of him, and they handed him to me, and he died in my arms that day. And I still had my daughter, but that was a huge piece of my heart that's been annihilated. After that, abusive relationship is now over, and I'm trying to find healing somehow. 
you know, when you're when you're down that low, you just you just don't get back up very fast. You just don't. Um, it takes a long time to get out of that. So God sent me someone very special to me, and he's still in my life today after 16 years, and he allowed me to see what love is and what um, kindness is and understanding, and that I am beyond feeling useless, helpless, and worthless. I am I'm above, above that. I, I know I have worth, and it took a long time for me to know that after being brought down for so long. So we get married, and we um, live our lives, and he decided to take on kids that weren't his, which is awesome, and treated them like they needed to be having a dad. And uh, I had another set of twins, another boy and a girl. And one day, I was home, my husband decided to go off and be an iron worker, which is awesome because he found a passion for it, and one day, I was cooking, uh, two, two of the kids that were older, they were at school, the other three I had at home, and one day, I was cooking lunch, I put a pizza in the oven, they were playing, not a big deal, and I call them back all back up there to have lunch, and I said, where's your sister? And they're all little. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. So I said, okay. So I, I go downstairs and I had a dresser that had nothing in it. She opened up the drawer and sat in the four drawers. She sat in the second one from the bottom and it fell over and suffocated her. Oh. 20 months old. And I was by myself that day. You could just imagine the guilt, the shame, the blame, you can just imagine literally on your hands and knees picking up the carpet off your floor because you don't know what else to do. And you cry out, what am I doing? What is going on? Why am I going through this again? And you're just, your heart is just completely shattered and it's ruined and it's destroyed and it's just in all these pieces and you just don't know what to do with them. You can't pick them up and you can't give them away. And everybody's hugs are hollow and everybody's words don't even have a noise to them. You can't hear comfort. You can't understand anything anybody is saying. So your heart is completely in shreds. Counseling doesn't help. Grievance counselors don't help. They think they have the answers. Oh, the 12 steps of grief or whatever it is. When you're in it, you don't hear it. You don't hear anything. So, one day, it took a long time to heal from that, not only for me, but for my kids, losing brothers and sister. So, I gave all the pieces, all of my broken pieces, to God. Okay. And this is what I got back. These, this heart is what my heart looks like. It is, it is multicolored now, very um, different than how I had it when I was born. But he stitched it back together. And I didn't realize that when he stitched it back together, this is kind of what I saw with it, was this. I saw my heart being like this, just completely shattered all the way around, in and out. And it, after coming here um, and finding people, I feel so much love here that I don't, I've never felt before from a church. And, I didn't understand what God really was. I knew who he was and stuff, but now I really understand what he's about, and I understand that it's not just a, he's not a people God, he's a person God. And he takes care of everybody individually at the same time as a group, and I didn't realize that when, this is what was in the center of my heart the whole time, and I didn't know it. He put my heart back together, he um, allowed me to find peace and joy, even though 
my storms were pretty rough. And um, I've never shared that with anybody before. And I, the only thing that pulled me out of this depth was prayer. And uh, I write songs and I don't have words to my songs because what I feel inside is far more deeper than words. And I kept it to myself a lot just because that's the way I got to pray. That's the way I got to get down and talk to the Lord is just playing the piano and just really focusing on, on the sounds. And I brought it to Angie's attention about the song and I told her, I said, I have a part of a word. I have, I have, I have like the verse, that's it. And I can't seem to put this together. It's supposed to have words, but I can't put it together because it hurt so much. So I gave it to Angie and um, she did a phenomenal job putting words to the tune that I had that I'd already written. And she offered to play it today with um, Christy because I can't. So um, I just hope everybody can maybe find a little bit of peace in their own broken heart and let God heal it for them.
seen a story. I've heard little pieces of it, but that's the first that I've actually got to hear. And, you know, I, I've had a week. <clears throat> uh, there have just been a lot of things on my plate this week, and none of them light. Um, because if you bring them to me, they're not light. You know, if they're light, you keep them to yourself. And so when somebody brings something to me, it's, it's a heavy thing. And I've been working this week. Uh, there's been, I mean, some things in people's lives that I just, I, I know there's a God because without him, there's no way people could deal with this. There's just no way. And I've, I've had talks with people this week, I've talked at people this week, and there's a difference. Because sometimes you're sharing with someone and their heart is open and, and they're, they're hearing what God would say to them, and sometimes you're sharing with someone and it's just <clears throat> bouncing off of them. And um, 10 or 12 days ago, God started kind of laying some things on my heart. He started giving me questions, and actually, I guess really what it was, was I was asking him questions. And he was kind of taking me down this process, working through different things. And, um, you know, as, as the pastor, I feel like it's my job to take care of everything. That's, 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 my, that's my purpose. That's what I'm supposed to do. And sometimes I forget that really all I am is the conduit to take things from you guys and pass them to God. Amen. And then take things from God and pass them back to you guys. And sometimes I, I get distracted and, and I take the things from you guys and I hold on to them. And, and I find myself calling out, God help me, I'm drowning here. I can't fix all these problems. And God, in his way that he does with me, he's so loving, he says, you can't fix any of them. That's not your job. And so this week, I've, I've got a number of people that, that I, I pray with, and, and there's a couple of different groups that every day, we share prayer requests with each other, and, and several days I just said, there's a lot on my plate, and I just need focus to know where, what I'm supposed to focus on and what I can lay down. Well, I'm not supposed to lay any of them down. I'm supposed to take all of them and pass them to him. And I'm, I'm learning that. But God has asked me, or I, I have been asking God a number of questions out of, as a result of some of these conversations I've had this week. And I just want to share with you kind of my process this week. These are the questions that I have been asking. And I want you to ask them of yourself. Okay? Do you know God? Or do you just know about God? Do you have this caricature that you have painted of the attributes of God that you find relevant to your life? Or 
or do you have intimate relationship with him? Are you known by God? Does he know you? Because one of the things that I've found is in talking with people, they can parrot all the right answers. You hang around church for a while, and you know the answers you're expected to give. And, and you're, you even give them honestly. <coughs> because that's what you're taught to give. But are they the truth? Not just the truth as you know it, or the truth as you've accepted it. Because the truth is, is much more than just us. I can have a conversation with Christy and repeat back to you the germane points of the conversation. And that is truth because that's what happened. But it's not the entire truth because she's going to tell you different parts of the conversation that were germane to her, that were important to her. And even between the two of us, we're missing the whole truth because both of us have faulty memories. Both of us are biased. We see and hear things and interpret them in light of our own position. And we do that with God. In a conversation I was having earlier this week, a, a verse came up, and this is one of the verses that haunts me. Matthew chapter 7, you don't have to turn there, but um, you can write it down and look it up later. Verses 13 and 14, Jesus is speaking, this is the, the Sermon on the Mount. He says, enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. Now, we've, we've, if you've been in church any length of time, you've heard this before. Broad is the way that leads to destruction, narrow is the gate, and Okay, yeah, I got it. But there's, there's two words that really jumped out at me when I read that this week. And it's not the two words that you would think. It's not wide, it's not broad, it's not narrow, it's not gate. The first one is this. The way is easy. That leads to destruction. It's easy. You don't have to do anything. Put it in neutral. It's easy. And by marked contrast, the way is hard. That leads to life. I have had 10 months that have been probably the hardest that I've ever had to deal with in my life. I've had one particular area of ministry that God has opened my eyes and I have wept before God, I have pleaded with God, I have begged God to deliver me, to take it away from me. If you're not going to take it away from me, then change me so that I can deal with it. But God, I can't do it the way that I am. It's too hard. And I'm going to share with you what that is. And, and uh, Some of you are going to nod your heads and you're going to agree, and some of you are going to look at me like I've got two heads. I'm not going to share this as a sob story. This is just so you understand where I'm coming from. I don't understand love. All right? I understand commitment. And those two are not the same thing. I don't get it. 
I have studied, I can give you definitions, I can give you examples, but I don't really understand it. I grew up with four siblings. I grew up in a very noisy, boisterous house. I was not noisy, I was not boisterous. Um, you know, I, I didn't talk. Even after Christy and I were married, I didn't talk. But one thing I wanted in my life, one thing, from the, I mean as far back as I can remember, one thing I wanted, I wanted one person that was mine. That didn't have to go here, go there, go everywhere. That I was their one thing. And I could pour all of that I was into that one person, and they would pour all that they were into me. And God gave me that with Christy. And sometimes we take the gifts of God and we twist them. And we make them something that they're not supposed to be and we're not intended to be. And somewhere from the time we married, to even now, I don't know how, I wasn't conscious, but I restructured my life. And I took God off of the throne of my heart and said, you have to stand here because my wife is going to be there. And then about 10 months ago, we had been praying, God, use me however you want. Glorify yourself in me. Make of me whatever you would. Make me a tool fit for your hand. Whatever you want, God, I will do it. And I thought, man, he's going to send me to China. <laughs> and a lot of you, you don't understand, I don't want to go to China. <laughs> they eat weird things over there. And I was ready. I told him, it's your house, it's your cars, it's your stuff. You can take it all, send me where you will. But about 10 minutes ago, he started answering. <coughs> and he started opening my eyes to how I had twisted this relationship. And he spoke to me and he said, I have given you Christy to be your wife, but she's my daughter first. And you have to let me do with her as I choose. Well, you think, oh, sure, hey man, if it's what God wants, great, it's going to be fantastic. It wasn't, it stunk. And it was hard because I could see, I could feel that she wasn't all mine now. That God was putting in her heart other things. And I railed against God. Why would you do this? How dare you do this? She is my wife. And ever so lovingly, ever so consistently, he would say, she She is mine first and always. And so I have been learning. God, every morning I pray, God, please help me to keep you on the throne of my heart. And there are some days where it is so easy. God's spirit is on me and things come up. And man, yes, this is right, let's move forward. And there are days where it is not easy at all. Where nothing she can do makes it right. And I hurt and I call out to God, God, I don't want to hurt. I don't want this. Send me to China. <laughs> you can laugh, that's okay. <laughs> I 
And there's a passage of scripture where Jesus says, Anyone who loves father or mother, son or daughter, <coughs> husband or wife, more than me is not worthy of me. And another gospel, it even turns that around and it says, if you do not hate them, you are not worthy of me. And I got to the point where I was loving my wife more than God. And I wouldn't allow certain things in my life because of what I thought it would do to my relationship with my wife. And God would move on me and I would say, God, up to this point and no further. I will not go beyond this point. Well, a couple verses down from the verse I just read, Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. <clears throat> Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. See, salvation is such an easy thing because he's done all the work. There's nothing you can do to make yourself righteous before God. So he's made a way. He's allowed a way for you to be righteous before him. But the cost is great. Because you have got to give up your life, your rights, who you think you are, and take on everything he has for you. It's hard. It's hard. The way is hard. The gate is narrow. And few are those who find it. Luke writes the same exchange. Why do you call me Lord, Lord? And do not do what I tell you. Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when a flood arose, the stream broke against the house and could not shake it because it had been well built. But the one who hears and does them does not do them is like a man who builds a house on the ground without a foundation. When the stream broke against it, immediately it fell, and the ruin of the house was great. See, many of us have a testimony of an emotional moment or an intellectual decision. <clears throat> and we can tell people all about God. Many of us, there are, there are people that I know that can quote this backwards and forwards. They know more about it than I will probably ever know. But they don't no, God. See, when you come to him, Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, when Christ bids a man come, 
he bids him come and die. See, when you come to God, there are no lines in the sand. You can't present yourself before God and say, I will give you this much, but this I keep for myself. This is mine. You can't mark a line in the sand and say, God, I will go this far in you and no further. You can't do it. Because you have to give everything. You have to give your life. I mean, if you're going to die, you don't get to hold back part of your life. You're either alive or you're dead. What rights does a dead man have? Man, when you're dead, they can do with you whatever you want, whatever they want. You hope that your wishes are carried out when you're dead, but really, it's not up to you. That choice is gone. I don't care what they do with me when I'm gone. Put me in a box, float me down the river, put me in a fire, burn me up, I don't care. Because that's not me. That's not me. When you come to Christ, if you truly die unto him, he can then make in you the image of his son. And the name Christian becomes entirely a different thing because you are a bearer of Christ and your life will reflect his image and his glory. And you won't care about your pride. You won't worry about what people are going to think about you. Because it's not about you. It's about him. And what did he say? Hey, look, they're going to hate you. Because they hate me. But he didn't end it there. What did he say after that? Rejoice! You've been counted worthy. Great is your reward in heaven. You've heard the saying... If you were accused of being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict? See, Christ has told us some things that bear witness to him living inside of us. Okay? You can go out and tell people all kinds of things. And we do. People, man, people lie all the time. Man, that fish that I got was this big. But the one that I actually reeled in was this one. Uh. Oh, back in my day. Oh, I, man, I use that on my kids all the time. <laughs> you guys got it so easy. Your mom takes you to school every day. I had to walk in a blizzard uphill both ways. And that was kind of true because you had to go up a hill and down a hill and up a hill. So I didn't tell them about the down part, just the up part. No shoes. No, I had shoes, but I did get buried under snow one time. They sent us home from school early because of a blizzard. And the snow plow buried me. <laughs> Literally, buried me. All those were the days. <laughs> But if you are professing to be a Christian, there are certain attributes in your life that will bear witness to this. One, do you love each other unconditionally? By this the world will know that you are my disciples, that you have love one for another. Or do you parcel out in measure your love? 
so long as they don't offend me, so long as they agree with me, so long as they are a Broncos fan, so long as whatever. Whatever. Do, do you give it in measure, or do you give it unrestrained? Pouring out fully, as God has poured out to you. We're working through a series on the fruit of the Spirit. Now, God tells us that when we come to Him, we are sealed, stamped with His Spirit as a sign of salvation. There are times where I've been talking to someone or I've, I've just observed someone that I know that they have a relationship with God because I can see the reflection of Spirit in their lives. There have been times, and I'm, I'm, I'm afraid to say there's only been a few, that people have come to me and said, you're a Christian, aren't you? Well, yes, I am. I could tell. I believe it was St. Augustine that said, preach always. If necessary, use words. I disagree with that. I think our word should always be preaching. Because man, what, what else do we have to talk about that's of any value? What, what do we have that's of any value that we can share with other people? Okay, we can talk about the weather, but who's the one that gave you the weather? Man, you can talk about fishing, but who made the fish? We can talk about anything in this life, but there's always a consideration as to how God is involved in that because there is nothing in this life that God is not involved in. I want to challenge you today, right now. Take a moment. I want you to reflect on your life and see where you have drawn lines in the sand and said, God, I will go this far and no further. This I will not do. And I want you to know I want you to be encouraged that there are people in this fellowship that are praying desperately for you. We may not know what you're facing in your life, what's going on in, in this moment. We may not know what struggle you are struggling with because really the ones that are closest to our heart, we keep in our heart. We don't want to share those with people. Those, those are private. Those are tender. Those are vulnerable. We keep those guarded. But that's okay. I don't have to know the details. God knows. I'm a conduit. I take the burdens that are presented to me on your behalf, and I bring them straight to him. And every day, Christian, I pray for you guys. Every day, Christian, I pray for you guys. Every Wednesday, people gather here in this church to lift up this body before God and ask him to do as he would to glorify himself. Look, our enemy is shrewd and crafty and always at work. And some of you, he's coming at you like a roaring lion. And he's intimidating and he's scary and he's got you on your heels. But we serve the lion of the tribe of Judah. Amen. And some of you, he's come at you as an angel of light. And he's invigled his way into your life. And you're not really sure what happened, but somewhere you've gotten off stride. Your focus has shifted. It's drifted off of what you should have it. And he's, he's titillated you. 
and he's attracted you, and he's distracted you. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. His truth is there for you any moment, day or night. But you have to be willing to hear it. And you have to be willing to respond to it. Because some of you, he may be asking you to lay down something. Lay it down. And some of you, he may be asking for you to pick something up. He's placed it before you and you said, I don't want that. That's hard. Yeah, it's hard. He didn't tell us it would be easy. He said it would be hard. He said it would be worth it. He also said that I will be with you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And I will bear your burdens. Give them to me. He will never put anything on you that you can't handle with him. He always provides a way of escape that you could stand. His word is rich and alive with promises. Now look, if you are professing to be a Christian and you cannot read this, it's dry, it's boring, it's a labor. Then you do not know the author of this book. Because this is his passionate letter to you. Showing how he has moved heaven and earth to make a way for you to have intimate and eternal relationship with him. Now, there's a lot of things in here that you go, well, how does that even work? <clears throat> Ask him. You know, when Jesus was resurrected from the dead, he came to the disciples, and the scripture says that he opened their minds for the understanding of scripture. The more you know God, the more you will find passion for this. The more passion you have for this, the more you will know God. This should always drive you in your relationship with Him. It should always drive you to your knees in prayer, on your face, in intercession, in repentance, in confession. Because this is always new. It's living. It's active. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. Capable of dividing the bone and the marrow and the spirit and the soul. Now don't get me wrong. There are times where you know God and you're reading his word and, and things are just off. And it's hard. It's a labor. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about you go, eh, no, not for me. I don't get it. I don't want it. I challenge you today. Allow God, allow His Spirit, the Spirit of Truth, to speak to your heart and your mind. <coughs> and show you what he would have of you. Allow him to show you those areas that he wants to clean up or he wants to eliminate. Allow him to show you those things that he is calling you to because there is not a single person that God has not called that is not called to greatness. To greatness. Now, Keep in mind, it's God's definition of greatness. Because man, you can stand up before man and receive man's applause, just for example's sake. If you're not applauding me, don't worry about it. Okay. But if you stand before God, 
and he says, I never knew you. All of that is just a wisp in the wind. All right? But if you stand before man and nobody applauds you, you stand before man and not, there's nothing. But you're standing there because that's where Christ has put you. All of heaven, all of heaven is applauding you. And your father is looking down on you with love and compassion and pride, saying, that's the one I love. That's my kid. And they're doing what I've called them to do. Satan, look at that one. That one's mine. You can't do anything to them. What can you do to them? They're mine. That's greatness. To have your father be so confident in your relationship with him that he can say, yeah, go ahead, Satan, try it. Go ahead. Because all it's going to do is bring glory to me. So I challenge you today, seek God's spirit. Ask him to reveal to you what he would. God, what do you want me to lay down? What do you want me to pick up? What do you want me to become? What do you want me to do? God, help me to press into you, to push, to not be content, to wipe out that line in the sand and to cross it, to embrace everything you have for me, to endure hardship. That, Father, my life might reflect your glory. Tell you now, it's hard. It's hard, it's hard, it's hard. But He has promised us that He will be there with us and He will walk through it with us. He will walk through it with us. And there are times when I slip into my flesh and I, I go, God, I don't want this. Take it from me. Please, God, deliver me from this. Take it, change it, make it something else. But then when his spirit is on me and I'm walking according to his spirit and I'm denying my flesh, it always, always, always works. Always. <clears throat> Never once in 10 months of struggling with this have Christy and I been walking according to his spirit that it didn't work. Pastor Glenn, why in the world would you bother walking in your flesh? I'm stupid. Because it's the pattern of my life. When presented with a choice, I go with what I know, and what I know is walking in my flesh. And I get that choice, and I say, okay, I can do this according to God's Spirit, knowing that it will turn out for my good, or I can do it according to my flesh, knowing it's going to turn out miserable. I know my flesh. Let's go that way. And after it's miserable for a while, he brings me right back. Which way are you going to go? <clears throat> it is worth it. It is worth it. Father, I just lift you up this morning. I honor you today, Father, because you are good. We understand good only by understanding you and the goodness that you have toward us. I ask, Lord God, that your spirit would be upon us. Father, open our eyes to see what you would have us see. Make us blind to everything that would distract. Open our eyes to see what you would have us see. Father, those things that you would ask us to lay down, give us strength, Father, to lay them down. Father, those things that you would have us take up, give us courage, Father, to take them up. Father, to give up. 
the rights that we think we have to control our lives. To make our hearts soft and pliable to you, that you would do with them as you would, to relinquish our lives to your complete control, to take us where and make of us what you would. God, I am asking that this body, this family, this fellowship, Jesus Community Church would embrace everything that you have for us, even knowing that it will be hard. And give us peace. Grant to us, Father, your peace. that would guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. That even in the midst of the storm, we would find rest because we know that your plans, your heart toward us is good. We honor you today, Father. thank you for what you've done, but we honor you because you are worthy of honor. Help us, Father, to bring glory to your name. I ask this in the name of your son, Jesus.